We are about to start our first tutorial of the morning. Tasha and Wilson will be presenting remotely. And this is going to be a tutorial about CryoCloud. And there's a lot of interactivity in this tutorial. And the way we'll work this is Mark and I will have microphones and we'll be moving throughout the space. And if anyone has comments or questions that we need to relay back to our presenters, that'll be the mechanism because we'll be able to pick up the audio through the microphone. So hold your question until we get to you with the mic. Anything else, Mark? All right, well, really glad to have Tasha and Wilson online. I'll hand it over to them. All right, thanks, Anthony. Um, hi, everyone. Can everyone see my screen okay right now? It's great. Cool. Um, just for a quick intro, I'm Tasha Snow. I'm a researcher at the Colorado School of Mines. I'm out in Colorado right now. And um, I'm uh, one of the leads for CryoCloud. So I'll be helping to teach you how to use CryoCloud today. And, um, and I'll be one of the people you can interface with if there's any issues. And then after the hack week, we'll also be um, supporting you as you continue to be able to use CryoCloud afterwards. Um, Wilson, do you want to introduce yourself? Hey, folks, I'm Wilson Sautoff. I'm a PhD student at Colorado School of Mines, and um, I was lucky enough to be the graduate student support for CryoCloud. So I've really been embedded and contributing to this project, and it's really been uh, wonderful to, to be working with Tasha and get to learn this stuff firsthand. Um, and so, yeah, I'll be giving part of today's presentation, and I'll be try I'll try to be online as much as possible on the Slack for the Hack Week. I couldn't make it in person, unfortunately, but I'll try to be as involved as I can at being hybrid. Cool. So we're going to dive in now. Um, before, so we'll start out with some slides in just a moment, and then we'll work through this um, workbook that's right in front of you. This is on the tutorial um, Jupyter book in uh, the ISA2 Jupyter book. And so you'll be able to access it there. And um, we'll also show you how you can access all of this from CryoCloud itself. And um, clone that into your, your repository in, uh, towards the end of the session today. But just for a little bit, um, thinking about our learning objectives for this, we're going to learn how to access and use CryoCloud, and then we'll open um, CryoCloud and um, learn how to use the tools and clone the, the website. Um, so you can use this tutorial to access the PowerPoint that I'm going to show you here. Um, so here's our, our PowerPoint. You can scan using um, this uh, QR code. Let me get this into, how do I view this properly, slideshow? Um, yeah, you can use the slide URL at the bottom or the QR code to access this as well and get all of the links and things that you'll need because there's a bunch in here that you can use later. Um, so the reason why we're using CryoCloud, it's using cloud, the cloud to virtually access data and work together and collaborate. It CryoCloud specifically helps you accelerate your science and makes open science easy. So what you'll find after this um, presentation and after using CryoCloud is that it allows you to open data one to two orders of magnitude faster than you can from your personal computer. Um, it makes collaboration a lot easier. It eliminates technology bottleneck bottlenecks. We have an environment already installed that has most of the things that you need to use. And we provide code for data access that makes it a lot easier to access different kinds of um, data sets that you'd like to. Um, so that streamlines, streamlines all of those processes and the overhead that you normally have associated with science that um, we all hate to have to manage creating these environments and things kind of gets eliminated using CryoCloud. CryoCloud's also easy to use and cu customizable. We try and make it have the same software as what you have on your local computer, on a high performance computer um, and in the cloud so that it's easy to move between these. Um, and do your work in all, all of these different spaces without having a steep learning curve. So today um, in this presentation, we'll talk about open science with NASA. 
introduce the cryo cloud, get to know it, um, demo it, and then get some important information and wrap up. And then we'll, we'll end with a task to get oriented and clone that repo. Before we get started with anything else, what we'd really love for you to do is fill out this onboarding survey here. You can use this QR code. Um, it gives us a little information about um, what you already know about the cloud. I'll give you about seven minutes to be able to do that. Um, if you haven't done your getting started survey that where you provided your um, GitHub user ID and, and got access to CryoCloud, you can do that right now in that bottom right hand corner down here. Um, but this onboarding survey is really important for us to meet our project requirements for NASA um, and to help build an understanding of what y'all need for um, using the cloud. So if you can fill both of those out and if everyone can make sure that they can open and access cryo cloud without receiving an error, um, that'd be great for the next like seven to 10 minutes.
All right, I'll give us another 30 seconds maybe unless we need more time. All right, let's get moving. I see a bunch of hands raised. Is it okay for me to keep going or? We uh, just did a quick show of hands of who was done with the survey, Tasha. So I think we're good to go. Okay, <laughs> cool. <laughs> All right, then let's keep going. Um, yeah, so we're gonna talk a bit about the opportunities and challenging uh, challenges of working in a cloud environment today, the general um, technical tools you'll need to work in the cloud and, and gaining access to Crowd Cloud for its utility um, for helping you achieve your research problems. Um, for a little bit of background on open science and everything that's been going on in NASA and the federal government recently, um, NASA decided that science done in a fundamentally more open way was the way of the future. And um, here's a definition of open science. It's that the principle and practice of making research products and processes available to all while respecting diverse cultures, maintaining security and privacy, and fostering collaborations, reproducibility, and equity. And NASA along um, has been creating this huge push for open science recently, and that's kind of where Crowd Cloud came out of. They have the Open Source Science Initiative, where they're working to make science more transparent, inclusive, accessible, and reproducible. And um, under the um, this initiative, under the umbrella of that, the Transformed Open Science Program, TOPS, has been working to lower barriers um, of entry for historically excluded communities. Um, and increase opportunities for collaboration while promoting all of the goals for the um, open source science initiative. And NASA and the rest of the US federal government um, declared 2023 the year of open science. And so a lot of the federal agencies are all have, making this push now. Um, that was kind of led uh, in a lot by NASA. So um, all, of, all of these different federal agencies, as well as um, 80 different academic institutions are, are really pushing for open science. And the cloud is a place where we think we can do a lot of collaborative reproducible open science. And so just a little background on the cloud. It's a virtual workspace where you can keep servers, um, software, all of your applications and data all in one place virtually. And so anything that requires internet or a router is not um, part of the cloud. And um, as this group from NASA and um, other open science groups has kind of declared, it is a place using the cloud as a, a way that we can kind of change the realm of, of possible questions that we can ask in science. And it allows us to advance science and inclusivity simultaneously. So I'll talk a little bit um, about that here coming up. One of the ways that it helps us to be more inclusive is to, um, by making this large compute, large data analysis opportunities, making data accessible, no matter what sort of computer you're on, whether it's a small Raspberry Pi, like you can see here in this, twit, uh, this tweet, this $36 Raspberry Pi, you can do massive amounts of, of compute from, or you can do it from your cell phone on a flight. And so as long as you have a little bit of internet and some sort of computer, you can start to be able to do large um, data analysis studies, and um, which historically has only been accessible for people who have large compute. Um, in large research institutions. And so the cloud kind of becomes this place that is a digital watering hole. So everyone needs to use the data. It's the shared, shared resource. Um, and the cloud allows us to use really big data to integrate disparate kinds of data um, to allow 
participation of disparate and diverse communities and ultimately connect with society and impact critical decision making on timelines that these groups need um, solutions to their problems. So we're able to do this much more rapidly um, in the cloud. And so there are some concepts and skills um, for better using a computer as a tool for thought that we that kind of contribute to how we can use the cloud. Um, so there are practical skills um, that we can use. And a lot of these you will be learning throughout this week if you haven't already. So we'll learn version control, programming, process automation, data analysis, software testing, documentation and publishing, um, continuous integration and reproducible con containers, um, how to use all of these. And these are on the right are just examples of, of how you can do each of these. And so a lot of these have been used and displayed how we can use really efficiently in the cloud in the Stats 159 course um, led by Fernando Perez at Berkeley. Um, in this course, over the course of a semester, they put together scientific projects and they create a Jupyter book, a main paper, supporting analysis notebooks, um, supporting code and tests, and make it reproducible using Binder. And so by the end of the semester, it's completely open, it's completely accessible to everybody and super transparent based on these um, kinds of different practices that, that you'll be learning about in the, um, in the hack week. And what's really cool about it is they do this course in the cloud and these courses have 50 to 2000 students and they're working in the cloud for one to $2 per semester per student. And so what that means is we can do this very cheaply with some of specific kinds of platforms and resources, we can make these kinds of skills accessible and make all of this open and transparent. So, um, so it's really cool what we can do in the cloud. So it's kind of just a demonstration of what we can do. Um, with this new cloud space for us to work in, um, we need new organizational models to be able to work in it together. And that's kind of where CryoCloud comes in. So CryoCloud kind of came out of an ISET2 science team meeting that happened last year where um, there was a cloud computing and open science panel that um, several of us sat in on where so the science team talked about how, you know, the cloud had non-intuitive pricing structures, the computing options were challenging, infrastructure was challenging, documentation was poor, it was costly to use, people were charging up a lot of money without realizing it. Um, there are worries about intellectual uh, theft, and it wasn't obviously more collaborative or faster. And Joanna Milstein and I um, were the two people who kind of um, put together this idea for cloud, cloud cloud. And we were sitting there and we were like, this is not true to our experience of working in the cloud. And um, the reason why that was, is because we had been working in the cloud using um, infrastructure built by the International Interactive Computing Collaboration, 2I2C. They're a nonprofit who builds interactive computing infrastructure in the cloud. And they're a group that is really cool, contributes back to open source communities. They were originally started at Berkeley, UBC, and um, from Pangeo, who had all built these cloud platforms that were super successful. Um, and everyone wanted them, but they weren't able to actually, you know, provide those sorts of resources from those institutions. So they founded 2I2C um, as a nonprofit with the mission of education and science um, and research to make cloud access cheap and affordable, um, but also perfect for and built for the, our needs. So, um, so we decided to work with 2I2C, partner with them to build a cloud computing platform with bumpers. And the goal was for it to be simple and cost-effective, um, a managed cloud environment for training and transitioning new users to cloud workflows and to help us also determine community best practices. So it was built and developed for cryosphere scientists um, specifically, that includes all of ISAT2 um, science team personnel and happy people. And um, it allows us to process data faster and democratize science. So CryoCloud is meant to be persistent for at least three years. We're hoping to get funding beyond that to keep everyone on here for longer. 
um, we provide small servers for all of our users with the option of you bringing your own cloud credits to access larger ones. We're building new tools for personal cost monitoring and intra and interhub collaboration tools that will be built into the Jupyter ecosystem. And we're also helping 2i2c to scale. So they're relatively new. Um, we're using the community surveys and feedback and guidance to help them um, make better, um, provide better service and to allow them to grow larger. So what we end up getting um, from this collaboration is this community hub where we have custom environments, online content, cloud infrastructure and support services. And all you need to have is your GitHub user ID and password to authenticate and access it. It's very simple. So CrowdCloud provides us a unified experience for research computing, it looks the same across our personal computers. Um, we'll show you in just a little bit, but it's got a Jupyter Hub, our studio, as, as well as MATLAB. Um, and we'll walk you through what um, the pieces of what you'll see in here. So in the Jupyter Hub, you'll have a rich workbench where you'll have a full terminal, you'll have file management, you can access Markdown, both preview it and edit it. You can launch different kinds of tools. You can view data in different ways. Um, you can do your normal computing. So there's a Linux desktop in there. There's QGIS and we have um, QGreenland loaded onto QGIS. So if you use the QGreenland um, program, you can access it there. We have sync thing, which allows file synchronization. It works like, um, like Dropbox does between your different, um, your personal computer, the cloud, um, you can set that up for yourself. And we have a lot of versatile choices um, for computer language and server size. So as I mentioned, we have MATLAB, Python, and R. And if you use MATLAB, um, you'll just have to use, or you'll have to bring a um, license from your own uh, institution to be able to access it, but you can access it from CryoCloud and we'll, we intend to have Julia soon as well. And then you'll notice there's, um, there's a node sharing option where you get to choose your server size um, all the way up to 32 gigabytes. On this one, there's a new one that was just loaded. We'll show you in a little bit um, where you have different uh, selection op options. But these numbers, what they tell you is basically the amount of memory that you are specifically allotted. And if you go over that up to 32 gigabytes, you may or may not crash your server. So um, while you're working in your notebooks, just check on how much memory you're using and think about that when you open your servers. Um, most of the time, people don't need any more than eight gigabytes. But if you're doing large things, you might need something larger. So eight to 16 gigabytes is what we expect for projects, um, but you can use up to 32. And so what people do in this node share is, um, say you chose four gigabytes and a bunch of other people chose four gigabyte um, servers, we have up to 32. So you have a number of people on the same server sharing it and that brings costs down for us. It also allows you to start your server a lot faster. Um, it warms them up. So uh, it's a really cool uh, cost saving um uh, set up that we have for CryoCloud. And with CryoCloud, we have a bunch of different kinds of users all in one place um, to accelerate feedback and collaboration. So this is kind of an example of a notebook that I've run in Python. Um, within it, we open data sets from ISAT2, Modis, Landsat, and we're using different tools like X-Array, IcePix, and Earth Access. And what's really cool is, you know, a lot of these tools are under development. A lot of these developers are um, working in CryoCloud. Some of many of them are actually sitting in the room with you right now. I know Jessica and Luis are, are there right now. And by using them in the cloud, we actively test it. We provide feedback when we find bugs that can immediately go to the developers who are also working in the same environment. It really speeds up how quickly we can fix bugs and um, really accelerates the um, like progress that we can make and make sure that these tools are created to our unique um, needs as researchers. So 
with that, let's take CryoCloud for a test drive. And Wilson's going to take over now and um, help you get into CryoCloud and using all the tools. Thanks, Tasha. Yeah, so um, I'm going to share my screen. And um, feel free to just follow along and watch. Um, you can also log on and kind of explore the hub as I'm exploring it as well, whichever is your speed you can do. Okay, great. Um, so your, your launching point is our website, cryointhecloud.com. So from here, it's a landing page to get to both the hub and this Jupyter book that contains a lot of the documentation that we're building around CryoCloud. So it's got tutorials in here about how to do certain things, um, some kind of basics on, on getting things set up and, and whatnot. I'm hearing a bit of feedback from Mo. Can Mo mute? Thank you, Mo. Okay, cool. And then there's uh, the hub here. And so um, this will open a, a new tab and you can always start from here. So if you know you're going to the hub versus going to the Jupyter book, you can just type in hub cryonthecloud.com and it'll bring you here and this is where you click to log in and then yes um, as Tasha mentioned there's been a, sub, a special instance for the ICAT 2 hack week we've got a couple options as far as um, the server size um, it sounds like there might be maybe a smaller one later in the week when that's set up but um, these were kind of designed for your project work which will be a little bit more computationally expensive uh, but normally what we have is just this selector here. And so I'm going to select that today because what we're doing is pretty simple um, and we won't need a lot of computational power. So I'll, I'll go down here to small. Um, uh, you first select your language. Um, we've got a notebook that's in Python, but as Tasha said, you, we've got MATLAB and R available as well. Um, and then there's an array of node share sizes. So um, we're doing something pretty basic, so we can just probably stick with the four gigabytes. And we click start and this will start us up. Um, it's usually pretty fast. Um, sometimes if there's a room full of people, it might slow down, but um, yeah, there we go. Under 10 seconds. That's pretty good. Great. Um, so you will open up and this will kind of be uh, the default that you'll see. You'll have a file explorer here on the left that you can toggle on and off. Uh, and then there'll be this launcher screen. And this is going to look different depending on if you're in the R or the MATLAB instance. So the main difference will be instead of opening uh, a Python script or a Python notebook, uh, if you're in the MATLAB or the R, you'd be opening RStudio or MATLAB, depending. Um, so yeah, I'll just kind of uh, walk you through this. So you can see here the file browser on the left. Uh, mine has a lot more folders than yours because I've been on here for a bit. Uh, but you can see it's just like being on your local computer where you have a file system where you store things. Um, and then from here, what we can do is we can um, create new things with the launcher. So we could create a new Python notebook. And wherever you are navigated into in the file browser, it'll set things up. Um, so for instance, I'll open up a notebook and you can see it just populated it here where I was. Um, same thing if I create a new folder here and then go into that folder. Uh, if I launch another launcher page, and let's say I want to make, um, instead of a, a Python notebook, I want to do Python script, um, it'll open it wherever you are navigated to. Um, so when you're in a notebook, you've got these different actions up at the top. You can save the notebook. It does auto save, but if you wanted to uh, save between auto saves, if you're getting ready to close it, for example, you do that. Uh, this will create new cells. Uh, this drop down lets you select between the cell type, you know, if it's code or if the markdown cell. And then um, you can do various things with the cells. Um, so you can, um, you know, copy them. Uh, you can right click and let's see, you should be able to maybe, uh, maybe you can do paste or I guess not. Um, um, so there are some differences between uh, what you're maybe used to doing in Jupyter Lab locally, but largely it is the exact same as far as the cell ac ac actions and whatnot. Um, and then this would just execute a cell um, and stopping, or excuse me, um, yeah, executing a cell. And then um, if you want to stop your kernel and restart it, so kernel is kind of the back end that's doing all the execution. And sometimes you need to restart it because um, it's, 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 it's not working or, or whatnot. 
Um, you can also download the file to, to bring it locally. Like, let's say you want to like email a notebook to some collaborator or something like that who's not working on Cryo, Cryo Cloud. Um, you can download that there. Okay, great. Um, so I'll X out of that. And then, yeah, if you haven't saved things recently, it'll, it'll prompt you to save. Okay, great. Um, so that's the launcher. We can do notebooks. We can open up a, a desktop, like Tasha said. Um, on the desktop, we've got QGIS installed. You can also open up a, a web browser here and, and browse the internet. You can also open up any of your files. So this is like your computer in the cloud. All those files that were in that file explorer, they're mirrored here on the desktop. So if we wanted to open something, um, for instance, oh, let's open like a, 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 let's open an image. So that'll open it in uh, a browser for you. Um, you can also open up PDFs. And then, yeah, as soon as you're kind of done in this virtual uh, desktop, you can see it open a new tab. So to get out of that, you just X out of that tab and then you're back to uh, the Jupyter Hub of CryoCloud. Okay, great. And then um, uh, as Tasha mentioned, there's this sync thing, which allows for synchronization between um, different, different um, uh, online uh, places that with where you might like store data or documents. So if you're interested in that type of thing, I'd recommend reading up on the documentation to get started. Okay, great. And then, um, yeah, uh, another handy thing to have is um, let's say I've got a notebook open. So I'll bring open that notebook that I had open. Um, sometimes you want to open up a console because you want to do kind of very simple um, commands like you maybe want to do um, some 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 very simple math or maybe you want to check out the dimensions of your data set um, before you actually write it up into code and then later need to delete it because you were just kind of playing around and trying to figure things out so you can open up a console that'll allow you to do that okay and then down here are some other options terminal this is the linux or max mac terminology for a command line so this is a place that we could open up and interact uh with with our with our uh, cloud computing environment where we might want to explore files or we might want to uh, git clone a repository on github and that's essentially just making a copy of a github repository to to this environment so um, for example um, we can see where we currently are we can uh, list the files that are there, th those sorts of things. Uh, that's where we do that. So if you're you're familiar with command line, you, you like using it, um, that's available to you. You can also create text files. These are great for quick notes or um, keeping like a, a, a notebook of the computing that you're doing, or perhaps you're writing a readme for one of the repos that you're creating. Um, and then another way that you can create readmes or other documents that are a lot richer in terms of their formatting is a markdown file. So this lets you write in plain text, but if you give it certain commands, um, you can italicize, you can bold, you can have headings, those sorts of things that make the document a bit more readable. Um, great. And then, yeah, I pulled this one up before. This is to create a Pi script. So this is if you were doing some sort of like helper function or something that was kind of simplistic that you might call in a notebook. Um, that's the way to do that. And then if you did have a notebook open and you realized, hey, this doesn't need to be a notebook, I maybe want to just save it to be a Pi script. It's that simple. Um, you can up here, go file and then save it notebook as. And you can actually uh, just adjust that uh, file name to .py. And so you can convert it to a Pi script. And so you can see it gives some of that um, information and the, the, any cells you had would be rendered as a Pi script. Cool. Um, and then there's this contextual help. It's not set up right now, so you can ignore that, that one. Cool. And then um, here's the file explorer on the left. Um, you can see I've got a bunch of folders and files. And then um, there's some that we will share in common. So this shared public. Um, this is kind of just meant to be ephemeral storage. Like, let's say I needed to send Tasha some files really quickly, and she was just going to go and grab them. This is a way to kind of share things briefly. Um, so don't uh, don't per expect things to stay on here to be persistent. And anyone can read what's on here. Anyone can edit. Anyone can delete. So um, definitely, you know, know that 
Um, it's really meant for just sharing things quickly. And then um, there's this shared folder. Um, so this is kind of like a curated list of things. Uh, so this we've used this in the past for uh, different workshops and whatnot, where we wanted to store files that people could easily access. And um, potentially we might have commonly used data sets on here that aren't yet um, um, able to be read um, through 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 um, like a file storage system like AWS or something like that. Cool. And then um, the shared read write. This is the way that people who have been granted access get to write to that shared folder. Um, so if you're in here playing around and you try to create a new notebook, you'll get this error um, that you don't have access to write, and even I don't have access. Cool. Great. All right. And then um, another handy thing about this file explorer is if you're working in a folder that's like the project, like let's say your project for the ISAT2 hack week, uh, what you can do is right click on it and you can create a favorite. Uh, I guess I've already favored this one. That's not a good example. Add favorite. So that'll populate things up here. And that's a really handy way to, to get to things you're using a lot. Uh, maybe it's a notebook. Maybe it's, it's um, a folder for your project. Uh, but that is quite handy. Um, and then as you're going through these folders, um, you can kind of see uh, the way I navigated things um, is this is kind of the way that you go back is you, you'd uh, click the folder that you're navigated to and you can kind of go backwards that way. And then you can also search for things. So um, it's quite handy. Cool. All right. Um, and then some of these things that are here on the side, uh, let's see if, if we've got a notebook open, we can use this to inspect the elements of it. And then um, we can also monitor the current the kernel usage, so how much memory that we're consuming with the what we're what we're doing. So this is kind of handy to kind of gauge what kind of node share size that you'll need. Um, so this is a handy feature. And then there's this uh, debugger that's not uh, not quite ready, so you can ignore that for now. And then uh, here on the left, uh, we talk about the file explorer. There's also this that uh, shows us our open tabs and the kernels that we have running. So you can see um, I opened some notebooks that I closed, but their kernel is still running. So the way that we want to, uh, we don't we don't need the kernel open if we're not we're, if we're not running the notebook. So this is a way to shut down individual kernels, or we can just shut them all down at the same time. Um, and then if we want to close tabs, we can do that here as well. And it just get, uh, asks for confirmation for, for closing things or shutting things down. And same with um, if you've got a terminal session. Cool. And then this is a, a, this is a Dask dashboard integration. Um, so Dask is a Python library that is used for parallel computing. This is a um, add-on for JupyterLab that we don't have working yet, but there are plans to get ready. And the kind of the target timeline is uh, December of this year. So look forward to that. And then here is a, um, a shortcut, uh, a graphical user interface way to interact with GitHub. So here you can um, open your file browser where you may already have GitHub repos cloned or copied to, to here. Um, you can also initialize a repo. Let's say you're starting something new, perhaps for your project for this week, or um, maybe one of your teammates created a project for this week and they've already made the repo um, and you just want to clone it so you can make your own changes. That's where you do that. Um, so if you've done this maybe in, in command line before, it's kind of the same idea where you'd copy and paste the URL of the repo and then it would clone it or copy it to, to CryoCloud. Cool. Uh, and then this is a table of contents. So if you've got a notebook open that has um, that has uh, different markdown cells that have headers or subheaders in it, that will allow you to navigate through the notebook. Um, so I'll just open up a, a quick example of that. Um, so you can see here this notebook that uh, Tasha and I created, um, it's got markdown cells. You can see it's a markdown cell here. And then it's got this coding that lets you know this is a header. And so that will display here in this table of contents where you can easily just navigate through um, and go to your 
to your headers. Um, so if you've got a really long notebook, this is a really um, handy way to navigate through certain things. Cool. Let's see. All right, and then this is another place where there are the extensions that are available on on uh, the Jupyter Lab. So Dask is an example of that, um, and then there's a, a bunch more that you know may be of interest to you. Cool. And then kind of the last thing to kind of run through are these um, uh, these commands here at the top. So these are commands that are on the file explorer. So this plus icon just opens a new launcher. Uh, but you also saw as I was navigating, you can also click that plus button to do the same thing. This is to create a new folder. So let's say you want to make a new folder for your your for some files, for instance, that'll do that. Um, if you want to upload files that are stored on your your local computer, this is where you do that. So you'd you'd um, just navigate to them in in this um, this um, pop up window. Cool. And then um, the same way to you can also do that, but with a drag and drop. I'll demo that, sorry, oh, lost the window there. Um, yeah, so if you've got a file and you just drag and drop, it does the exact same thing as uploading. So that's an option. And then um, another thing I wanted to point out was um, the, the way that you can interact with files in a very rich way. So um, we've got some files in here, like a CSV file that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, so it just opens it in a very human readable way. Uh, but we can also open it in another fashion. Um, so that just opened it in the CSV table that was very readable for us. But we can also open it in an editor and we can make edits if we need. Uh, same thing for other file types, like this is a GeoJSON file. Um, if you've ever had success in opening one of these on your computer, if you had the right software for it, you probably saw it as something like um, the code that was behind it. Um, give it just a second. There we go. Yeah, so you'd probably see something like this, but CryoCloud has these nice things built in where it can actually read that code and display it in an interactive capacity. So you can see here, we can zoom, we can pan. Um, there's a lot we can do here with different file types. So it's a really rich way to interact with things. Same with um, images and PDFs. If we've got a paper that's kind of associated with the analysis that we're doing, very handy way to have a lot of things open for a project all at once and being able to reference things uh, all at the same time is super handy. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and then um, this is just a, a way to refresh this file browser. And then this is another way to interact with GitHub. This is a, a shortcut to clone a repo. And then up here at the top are things that you are probably familiar with from other software programs. There's a help button. This has uh, a lot of the documentation that is around all the different tools that are integrated into the, the CryoCloud Jupyter Lab. Um, there's settings here that you can control um, how things look, um, the, the font sizes, uh, you know, the colors, those sorts of things. Um, this uh, also lets you interact, manage, and control your tabs. This is yet another way to interact with Git here. You can initialize clone repos here. Um, this is a way to, uh, uh, again, um, manage your kernels, uh, shutting them down, restarting, things like that, interrupting those, those things that can be kind of handy. Um, this run, this is for running different notebook cells. So um, usually we kind of do that with a computer board shortcut because it's a lot faster and easier. Uh, but if, uh, let's say you wanted to uh, run only a certain certain type of cell, like all the markdown cells, this is the place you do it. Uh, another place to um, adjust the view of different things. And then this ed edit button is kind of similar to the edit button that was at the top of, of the notebooks where you can um, control the cells, so cutting, copying, pasting, things like that, um, undoing cell operations, um, undoing things you typed in the cell, those sorts of things. And then here, um, this is file. So this would uh, this lets you uh, do lots, lots of things like closing a tab, 
um, saving a notebook as maybe a different file format, um, things like that. And then very importantly down here, when we're done with our session, um, we always wanna shut down our server so that we reduce the amount of compute that we're using. Um, we do have kind of a safeguard if you are inactive for 90 minutes, where it'll shut down the server for you, but that's 90 minutes that's being paid for. So if we can avoid that, we, we wanna do that. So you just go to file and then hub control panel, that'll open up a new tab. And then from there, you just wanna click the stop my server button. And that'll shut down your server, save CryoCloud money so that more people can cloud, uh, cloud compute for longer. And then from there, um, what you can do is either X out of these two windows, or you can click log off and maybe start a new session um, or X out of that window. And then you can see this is kind of still open, but eventually it tells you, you know, your kernel died and that's because your server stopped. So you just want to X out of that. Okay, great. Um, so that's kind of a, a run through. Um, I can stop if there are like immediate questions. Otherwise we have a few more slides and a quick little um, task for you to do in CryoCloud. While well, you're all are finding, um, if anyone raises their hand or anything, I have a couple other things I can add to that. Um, I wanted to clarify, so that's maybe, um, Wilson, if you can open up your hub really quickly again, just because you're sharing the screen. Um, the cool thing about Jupyter, the newer Jupyter Labs um, and hubs that is different than Jupyter Notebook is that you can copy cells from one no notebook to the next. Mm -hmm. um, and you can do that by right clicking on a cell and copying that cell and then right clicking in the location that you want it in the new notebook or in the same notebook and clicking um, paste cells you have to do it with a right click it doesn't you work with control c um, you can copy and paste text just like you would um, normally on um, a windows or mac i guess a mac machine with control c and control v text like pieces of text that you've copied and pasted. But if you wanna run chunks of an entire cell um, or multiple cells, you can highlight all of them using, by clicking on a cell, using shift or control to highlight multiple cells and then right clicking to copy those. So there you go, right click and you can say copy cells. And then if you click on the bottom, oh yeah, you can, and then here, click on the one of the cells and right click. Now see so you paste cells below and that copies all of them. If you yeah. use control C or control V, it will not work for copying those cells. And the other thing I wanted to note is that box that um, Wilson mentioned earlier, right straight above his arrow right now. Um, that is an in uh, straight above, keep going up. Oh, uh... Yeah, that interrupt kernel is just stop the 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 text running or the code running that you've started running whereas shut down kernel um clears basically all of your memory and starts your kernel fresh so you would not have all of the imports that you've already added and stuff like that so sometimes your kernel starts running and it won't stop if it gets stuck there you can go and restart kernel um and up in the using that kernel tab at the top and that will shut all of that down but if you are running cells and you just want to stop the cells that you're running and you don't want to lose any of your variables or anything you interrupt your your kernel um, with that box so i just wanted to clarify those two things are there any other questions Thanks, Tasha. I think I definitely, I think I maybe said shut down here. Um, that reminds me another way to shut down a kernel. Um, so you can see here these notebooks that have the green dot by them. That means they have an active kernel going. So if you right click on them, you can also shut down the kernel that way. And that saves you on memory. Yeah. Well, it seems like we can move on to the last bit of our presentation. Excellent. Okay, so just some quick quick housekeeping as far as interacting with CryoCloud and using it. 
um, as far as personal storage, so let's say you're uploading files that you need, uh, perhaps these are data sets that aren't um, uh, cloud streamable yet, or maybe, like I said, there's images or, or PDFs that you need to be referencing. Um, we just ask that you keep your file storage less than 10 gigabytes. And that's really just a, a cost saving measure. Um, and uh, to give you a sense of that, you know, if we store two gigabytes of data, that is that's costing us ninety dollars a month. Um, and then, um, but if you need more for that, more than that, for for instance, for something um, specific, just just chat with us, and and um, we can perhaps find you a solution, um, like find like applying for my cloud credits, um, that kind of thing. Um, or uh, perhaps using using a community S3 bucket to to store things that maybe more than one person are using. Cool. And then um, let's say that you want to install a library that's kind of niche and no one else is using it on Cryo Cloud. Um, and as you try to import it in one of your notebooks, it's coming up with this is not installed um, on the base image of the hub. Um, what you'll want to do is just use pip install. Uh, so what that looks like on, on the hub. See if I can figure out how to exit this screen. Oh yeah, here we go. Okay, cool. So um, let's just say we want to try to import something like um, use this one a couple of times, but I don't think it's on there. Um, yes. Let's see what happens. Uh, yeah. So you'll you'll get this message that it's not installed. So the way that you get around that is uh, you just do pip install, and then that library name. With with the percent at the front. Oh yes, thank you. Um, so this is something that we'd normally do in a terminal. Uh, so to let it know it's that kind of command, um, we would put this in front of it to let it know that it's not Python code, but it's something we'd be doing in the command line. It puts it and in so the correct. It puts this new import in the correct place for the kernel that you're using. Um, so it can get confused if you don't add the the percent sign at the front. So yeah, best practice is to have percent pip install while you're in a notebook. Mm, cool, thanks Tasha. And then yes, um, if you have more than one, you'll just wanna have each of those on a separate cell. And every time that you exit out of Cryo Cloud, uh, shut down your server and then come back in, you'll need to run those cells again. But you can see they're really fast. That one installed in a, a couple seconds. Okay, great. And then um, we've got a little bit more guidance on that, including a way to set up a persistent environment. Like, let's say you've got a, a few different libraries that are needing to be installed every 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 time you log on. Um, you can create a persistent environment by uh, again going to um, our Jupyter Hub, and we've got some some information on on doing that. And then, yeah, like I said, there is kind of a safeguard if you forget to shut down your server, where it'll automatically shut off uh, after ninety minutes. Uh, uh, but again, kind of the takeaways from, from my walkthrough is starting up, selecting your language, your, your server size, you kind of want to go as, as low as, as possible and then go up if you need. And then um, mostly you're going to be interacting here with the file browser and then notebooks and launchers from this pane. And then uh, again, you know, stopping your server by going file, file, uh, yeah, file, hub control panel, and then clicking stop my server. So those are kind of the three things that you'll be doing most this week. Okay, great. Um, and then as far as troubleshooting goes, um, this is a open science uh, uh, hack week. So this is really a, a place where you can rely on the community. There's all the organizers, uh, there's the, the ISAT2 Slack. So really don't hesitate to reach out for, for help. Um, and then, you know, if, if, if you see an issue in CryoCloud, um, we do have an issues page set up uh, through our GitHub. And, um, and then at the end of the hack week, as the, the help for the hack week is winding down, we will um, have another session on Friday that lets you know what are your, what are your ongoing resources for help. So that'll be on Friday. Okay, and then you know if you end up using CryoCloud for the analysis that you're doing for your scientific work, and it becomes something that is published, we do ask that you cite CryoCloud in in any paper that you write. And so here's a Zenodo link to do to 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 grab that to grab the citation. 
And then this is also a place where community members can add content um, and it'll be, it'll go here and have a DOI associated with it um, so that you could add that to your, your CV. Okay, and then these are these are the uh, the links that are associated with CrowdCloud, ways to get help, those sorts of things. So we'll discuss this more on Friday as, as we're wrapping up the hack week. Okay, lastly, um, we will have you do an exercise just to kind of get you uh, familiar with opening CryoCloud and doing a clone or copy of a repo. So um, go ahead and open your, your, your hub. So again, you can go to cryointhecloud.com and then from there, click on CryoCloud icon here, or you can just go hub.cryointhecloud.com, your, your, your choice. So I'll give folks um, a minute or so to do that. And then again, we're doing something pretty simple. So instead of using one of the ISET2 Hack Week um, uh, server options, go ahead and go down to small and just select uh, the, the default, the, the Python with the four gigabytes of node share, and then click start. dry run of this the other day and I just want to clarify something Tasha said then that um, you want to be careful with not picking um, too big a server beyond your needs but if you undershoot if I understood what Tasha said let's say there's 16 other small servers there and you use a lot of memory you'll crash everyone else's server it'll just completely reset it's not firewall to contain your space so um, don't go too big but don't go too small either is that correct Tasha? Yes. So we'll I'll show you just in a minute how you can um, actually protect yourself from that or know how much memory you're kind of using. So um, yeah, that's the that's a great thing to point out. Thank you, Ian. Okay, so I think that was probably enough time for people to log on, but definitely uh, speak up if if I need to slow down. So we've we've opened up. We've kind of in our our main space where we've got our file browser and our launcher. Kind of the typical way that you might be used to doing this or have seen people do it is opening up a command line. Um, so we would do that. And then what we're gonna have you do is copy the ISAT to Hack Week um, uh, uh, repository. And that'll have all the tutorials and, and whatnot that, are, that are, you're gonna go through this week. Um, so the way that we get to that is if we're on GitHub, um, we'll wanna go to the Hack Weeks GitHub page. And so that is just github.com forward slash ISAT dash two hack week. Um, and if you're just on the, the main GitHub, you can also click in this search bar and just search ISAT two. And it should be probably maybe the first hit or maybe the second hit. Um, and so you kind of navigate into it. Um, this is a particular repo. So we'd want to go kind of to the main GitHub page. And what we'll be doing is we'll be cloning this repo here, the ISAT2 Hack Week 2023. And uh, the URL for that is just, um, yeah, the, the main page and then that repo, which is uh, ISAT2 dash 2 dash Hack Week 23. So I'll leave this up for maybe like 10 seconds so that people can copy that or take some time to search for it. You can also grab it from the code button down below. The green code right there. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, um, way you typically do this is this code button here. Um, I was just kind of highlighting copy this it. so people read the full thing. But yeah, if you want to copy it real quick, click cop code and then this copy button. And then we'll head back to uh, CryoCloud. And then from there, uh, we can open up a terminal. But as I showed you, there's a bunch of other ways to clone a repo. Um, we can use this. This here, uh, we can also go to the Git here as well, or this one on the side. So there's lots of ways to do that. Uh, but uh, the way that we do it from Terminal, and um, Terminal is a very handy place to do things, and it's great to become familiarized with that. So uh, we'll, we'll just kind of do it here as a demo. Um, you'll do git clone. This is the command to copy a git repo uh, to where you are. So we'll do git clone, and then that address. And then from there, we just click enter. Oh, <laughs> I already have it. That's why. Uh, let me go ahead and delete that. 
Ah, um, let's see. I will navigate into a new folder and clone it there. Okay, let's try that again. Um, you have to change directory first. Oh, right. Thank you. Yes. You might have too many spaces. There's Let's try that again. There we go. Um, all right, let's try that get clone again. Change directory into that folder and then cloned. Yeah, and I only did that because I ha already had it cloned here in my main. You shouldn't need to change directories. You should be good to go to clone it into your 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 main directory. Okay, great. So I uh, went ahead and cloned it. Um, we are all done here. We can we can verify that. We can go in here and look. There it is. Um, and then from there, um, when you want to navigate to tutorials, you'll be in here and you'll go through book. And then from there, uh, the tutorials will be in here, including uh, the one that we just went went through. So um, this is a, a notebook that you can reference that'll kind of remind you of the things that we went through. Uh, we've got a link to the slides that we cover if you need to uh, refresh on that. Um, how to open CryoCloud, which we have done now. And then um, we just went ahead and cloned a repo. So if you need a reminder on how to clone a repo, that's there. And then when you're done with your session and taking a break for the day, taking a break to eat something, um, just a reminder on how to shut down the Jupyter Hub. Yeah, um, let's see, I think we might and have a slide or two more. If you go back to that really quickly, you can mm -hmm. see down at the bottom, uh, it says your memory, the memory that you're using there. So oh, you yes. can keep track of how much memory you're using down down there with um, all the work that you're doing. Yeah, hey, so you can... Yes, sorry. Aaron. Go I'm ahead. I was just gonna suggest, should we take a couple moments and just check in with folks to see that that cloning went smoothly on our end? Yes, that would be good. Okay. Could I ask uh, two or three helpers or more to maybe roam around the space and just check in if anyone needs help? That's a really important part of this week is to make sure we know where the tutorials are located. We know have some familiarity with with cloning and in Git things like that. And we have a question in the chat. Let's see. Yeah, and lastly, I'll just say, you know, these are uh, the, the, some of the funding organizations for CryoCloud, and then um, contact information for me and Tasha uh, is up here as well, and happy to field questions and, and chat with you one-on-one. -on -one. 